guide us, inspire us, lift us up into heavenly places. In Jesus' name, amen. So our study today comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. If someone were to ask me, Pastor John, what's your favorite book of the Bible? That would be a hard question to answer. Would it be Daniel, the book that has so many beautiful prophecies, or Revelation, the, the other book that goes hand in hand with that? Would it be one of the Gospels that tells the story of Jesus' life? Well, among the top five for sure would be the book of Genesis. I love the book of Genesis, the way it unfolds themes that are carried throughout the Bible. So today we're going to study the Gospel to Cain. The Gospel to Cain. And we're going to begin by looking at the first 15 verses of Genesis chapter 4. They're on the screen there. Follow along as I read. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. She said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the, the firstlings of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. It doesn't say explicitly uh, what that means, but from other stories in the Bible, we understand that that means that God sent fire from heaven and consumed his sacrifice. The Lord respected Abel and his, and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, this passage, this part of the text is the one that we're going to focus on most particularly today. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? No, Cain, you're not your brother's keeper, but you're your brother's brother. He said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth. This would be the second curse that fell on the planet. The first, of course, happening when Adam sinned, and the third when Noah's flood came. You are now cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear or my punishment is greater than I can be forgiven. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I will be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So that's the story. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. We're going to be focusing on verses 6 and 7 particularly, but there are some other things that we just cannot ignore. Misunderstanding God's timeline. What does that have to do with this story? Well, as it reports in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The Hebrew reads literally, I have gotten a man, the Lord. What did Eve mean when she said that? I have gotten a man, the Lord. Well, of course, they remembered the promise that the Lord had given recorded in Genesis 3 that a, a redeemer would come, a Messiah who would crush the serpent's head and bring about salvation. And so from Eve's point of view, she gives birth to this beautiful baby, Cain, and she says, I have gotten a man, the Lord. She thinks this is going to be the promised one. Sister White says, when Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its, what? Speedy, speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. How natural it is for human beings to jump ahead of what God's plan is. And Adam and Eve felt like there was no need for 4,000 years to pass before the Redeemer would be born, but God had his timetable in mind, didn't he? And that's not the only time something like that happened. The disciples felt sure that when Jesus came, 
he would establish the kingdom and all the fulfillment of the promises of, of Scripture would be, would be realized. But again, the promise tarried. When Paul wrote some letters, people misunderstood and thought again that the second coming was near and Paul had to explain it a little more carefully. Some things had to happen first before Jesus would come. So we need to keep that in mind. God's timetable is perfect and it will come to pass, although sometimes it seems like the promise delays. Misunderstanding God's timeline, the rapidity of evil, how fast the seed of sin blossomed into outright murder. You might think that, well, sin came along and there'd be minor infractions. Of course, all sin is sin. But there'd be, you know, maybe some white lies told or some other things that wouldn't be considered as serious. But here in one generation, it has blossomed, it has bloomed and borne the fruit of violence and evil. That's the nature of sin. And it continues with us today. Another theme that we see in this story that we just cannot ignore is the investigative judgment. Now, this is a teaching that our church embraces, and we are basically uh, unique in that stance, understanding that before Jesus comes back, there will be an investigation into the records of heaven, determining the destinies of all before Christ comes back with his reward. And I truly believe that this is something that is clearly taught in the scriptures. We recognize that some not in our faith don't see it that way and criticize our, our teaching on that. Some within our faith have questions and doubts, but I want to tell you that I have none. This is a teaching that is firmly established by the Bible in the prophecies, in the statements that are made, and in a special way in the stories that reveal how God acts. That's the clearest expression I find of how God deals with sin. There is a looking into before God takes action. We see this in the story of Cain. Throughout the Bible, we are told that there is a pattern of God taking a look before he takes action, making an inquiry, asking questions, conducting an investigation before executing judgment. Now, this isn't because God doesn't know. As we see in this story, uh, God certainly knew what had happened, but nevertheless, he asked the question, what have you done? And we see this at least five times in the book of Genesis alone. Five times. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin. God comes to them in the cool of the day. Have you eaten of the fruit? Now, does somebody really want to tell me that God did not know that Adam and Eve had disobeyed? Nevertheless, he inquired before action was taken. We see this in the story of Cain. We see this in the story of the flood. Genesis 6, God looked, God saw that the world was becoming so evil it required a drastic measure. Genesis 18 and 19, if you have questions about how God deals with sin, read those two chapters. Abraham sees three visitors come, he entertains them. He later discovers that it's actually the Lord and two angels. And what does the Lord say? The Lord says, I'm going to send the angels there to Sodom to find out if this rumor that I'm hearing, I'm paraphrasing, of course, this rumor that I'm hearing, if it's actually true, and if not, I will know. Read that passage there in Genesis 18 and, and see how it reflects so perfectly God's pattern of dealing with sin. Investigation before action. Genesis 42 and 44, we uh, studied a couple weeks ago talking about how Joseph, a, an accurate type or symbol, illustration of Jesus, investigated his brothers before he revealed himself to them. He gave tests to see if they were really changed. So the investigative judgment is clearly taught in the Bible and especially in the book of Genesis. Another theme that we could pursue is Genesis 4 and Revelation 13, two stories that go together hand in glove. What is Genesis 4 about? Well, it's about worship. That's the key element of the story, worship. But it has to do with true worship, which is based on obedience to God's command, as contrasted with false worship, which ignores God's commandments. That's the theme that we see in the story that leads to the righteous being persecuted and a mark being placed upon Cain. All these things tie together uh, in a beautiful way. Today, though, we're going to talk about the gospel to Cain. Now, we wish we could call it the gospel according to Cain, like it does in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel according to Matthew, giving us the idea that uh, the gospel that he's sharing, he received and accepted, and he's now sharing it as a personal testimony. But that's not the case here. 
We have no evidence whatsoever that Cain ever accepted the gospel. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he was of the wicked one. But nevertheless, there are things in this story that uh, explain, describe, lay out God's plan of salvation in a way that, that we should study them, even if Cain did not uh, adopt them. The three points that we're going to look at particularly uh, are these phrases. The Lord said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? He also said, if you don't do well, sin is lying at the door. He also said, its desire is for you, but, and I'm quoting now from the King James, I like it better because it's more strongly worded, thou shalt rule over him. So those three phrases there we're going to take a look at uh, more carefully. They are included in the passage that uh, was our scripture lesson, Genesis 4, 6, and 7. Cain was very angry, his countenance fell. The Lord said to him, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do, do well, sin lies at the door. His desire is for you, but you should or thou shalt rule over it. So that first phrase we're looking at, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Well, it's always helpful to look at the words. And you don't have to know the original languages. You've heard me say this over the years. You can go to your Blue Letter, Blue Letter Bible app, and you can have access to all the words. The Hebrew word there, you see, means to be good, to be pleasing, to be glad, to be joyful, to do right, to do well. If you do well. Well, this raises a question. Can human beings do well? Can we do well in our own power, in our own strength? No. But are there provisions made that allow us, can enable us to do well? Well, that is a fundamental question, isn't it? The Lord says, if you do well, was that just empty words that he said there? Or was it really possible for humans to do well? Well, from Hebrews chapter 11, the, uh, the chapter that uh, hallmarks those of faith, it says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was what? He was righteous. Well, that's another way of saying you, you, you are doing well, isn't it? To be declared righteous. God testifying, God bearing witness by the uh, consuming of his sacrifice. And then a few words later, by faith Enoch was translated so that he did not see, did not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he did what? that he pleased God. So is it possible for human beings through Christ to please God, to do well? The answer is yes. Now the devil disputes that, but it is absolutely true. The second part of that, if you do well, will you not be accepted? That goes along with it, ties together with it, doesn't it? Now I must confess to you that when I was in school, taking the languages of the Bible, I find them to, found them to be very different. The New Testament was written in Greek. And I was severely intimidated when I went to college. I was going to be taking a course in theology, and I understood that the first year of that course would involve the study of Greek, and I was scared to death. But what I discovered was that actually, at least for me, uh, Greek was not that difficult because so much of our English language derives from Greek sources, along with Latin. So almost every word that uh, was in your Greek vocabulary list, you could figure out some English word that was built from it. And that, and that made it uh, uh, quite, quite easy for me. I actually enjoyed uh, the study of Greek. Hebrew, not so. Hebrew, very few words come into English. I can only think of a couple, sack, cherubim, whatever. But uh, we tried our best to come up with some memory crutches, some links that would help us. And this was one word. The word accepted, as you see on the screen there, comes from a root that is nasa, and it's very prominent in the Old Testament. 654 times that word is used. So I'm trying hard to develop some sort of memory crutch that will allow me to remember nasa, and it means to be lifted up, to be exalted, to rise up, to rise, to be high. Can you help me out there? Nasa. NASA, 
NASA, to lift up, to rise up, to be high. I had no trouble remembering that word. But think about it. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Will you not be elevated? Will you not be lifted up? Will you not rise? Will you not be high? Can I put it that way? The Bible says it. Will you not be high? Well, there are a lot of people that are trying to get high by other, re- other means, aren't they? But there is a spiritual high when you do what is right and you are at peace with God. Can you say amen? amen. We know that to be true, don't we? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Will you not have a euphoria, a sense of well-being that goes when you are right with God? And that is absolutely true. There is a high when you do what is right and are at peace with God. You don't have to do things that will injure your health. You can experience this euphoria, this well-being by walking with God. Now, the Bible has many passages that uh, direct our attention to that. Psalm 1, my father's favorite psalm. Blessed is the man that, and it gives the the, uh, criteria there, all having to do with being right with God. Jesus, when he began his ministry, gave a list of what we call the Beatitudes. They all begin with one word. What is that word? Blessed. Blessed means to be happy, to have a good feeling, to have that euphoria or spiritual sense of well-being. And we're told in Revelation uh, chapter 20 that in the first resurrection, the ones who rise are described as being two words, happy and holy. The devil says that's not possible. Those two words cannot go together, the devil says. If you're going to be holy, you're going to be unhappy. You're going to be sour. You're going to be negative and so on. That's not the Bible teaching, though. It says that if you are holy, you are happy. You are blessed. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Will you not be lifted up? If you don't, sin lies at the door. Let's think about that phrase for a little bit. The word there you see means to stretch oneself out, to lie down, to crouch. This is a verbal picture of sin lying at the door like an animal ready to pounce on its prey. We have one Bible text that goes along with that in Jacob's uh, uh, recitation of the promises to his sons. He says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion or crouches as a lion who will rouse him. So this is the principle that the Bible gives to us. If we do not well, if we we make choices that go in the other direction, sin is ready to pounce on us and attack us like a ferocious animal and entrap us, enslave us. Paul said in Romans 6, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. And just before that, he said, do not let sin reign. Now, what do, what's another word for reign? To be king, right? To be on the throne, to rule. Do not let sin be king in your life. You see the word there, and again, it, it comes to our language. Uh, a basilica is where a king uh, resides. And you put that herb in your, in your uh, cooking. It's a royal herb, basil. Maybe you, somebody, maybe you know somebody with the first name of basil. To be king. Don't let sin rule or be king in your life. Now, the expression there intimates that it's possible for that not to happen. If he says, do not let sin uh, reign in your life, and that were an impossibility to eliminate that, then it wouldn't make sense. The very fact that he expresses it leaves the door open that sin need not be king in our life. The devil cannot force you to sin. He can make suggestions, he can present allurements and temptations, but he cannot force us to sin. We must consent, we must give our will in order to sin. But if you do, then, as the Bible tells us, the sin will wrap its tentacles around you and enslave you and make it difficult to break free. It's like a crouching lion waiting to pounce. Is there hope? Yes, there is. We uh, talked a few weeks ago about that man in Mark chapter 5 that uh, was enslaved to sin. And yet, is there hope? Absolutely. Christ can break the bonds of every fetter, every handcuff, and set us free. Uh, After the meeting last night, 
uh, we were chatting with uh, one of our guests here, and uh, she told me about a, a, a link that uh, has leads you to an article that's going to be in the review about a, a man who was enslaved in sin and uh, thought there was no way out. He was into drugs, he was into homosexuality, he was into many things, and yet seemingly on the pinnacle of success. Very wealthy, rubbing shoulders with all the elite, all the famous people, but knew somehow that there was something wrong. And through his niece, uh, who uh, became a Christian, uh, he, he found the Lord. He was into occultism. He was trying to uh, connect with his mother who had passed away. And he had gone to different seances and different mediums were putting, in touch, putting him in touch with his supposed mother. Uh, and then there came a time when it didn't work. Medium after medium failed to bring back his mother for him to get encouragement from. What he didn't know was that his niece was praying for him at that time, and the Lord was shutting that door. And it's a beautiful story. I hope you uh, find it in the review and, and read it. Jesus can break the bonds of sin and set us free. That's the gospel story. That's the gospel to Cain. He can give us the ability to resist the devil's temptations. We must understand that the victory is one of subduing the impulses of the flesh. Subduing. Not eliminating, but subduing. Saying no to the urges of our sinful nature. Ever since Adam sinned, the pattern uh, was affected. Every person born into this world came with a defective character, except for Jesus Christ. We were all born with inclinations and urges, propensities to do wrong. And they exist. But the Bible tells us that Jesus can give us power to say no. But we have to understand that that sinful nature is with us today and will be with us in this life. But we don't have to give in. We can subdue through Christ's power the impulses of the flesh. Well, before I go that, uh, the next one. The, the world says give in to your fleshly lusts. And as I was mentioning, this uh, man that was converted, uh, one of the things that happened in his life was that he was, uh, he was allowed to go and receive an award on, a, on part of a famous singer who had, had uh, sung this song that was translated as uh, Be Your True Self, something like that. And this was a person that uh, was speaking about her gay lifestyle and that you, she should be true to her, herself as she understood it and, and uh, expect that everyone would uh, accept her in that lifestyle. And so he went and, and received the award. This song had become hugely popular. And uh, while he was on stage, he disclosed his homosexual lifestyle to the crowd, to their, to their great cheers and so on. But even when he was doing that, he felt inside something wasn't right. But that's the theme of the, of the world, isn't it? Give in to your impulses. Follow your heart. But what does the Bible say? about that. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Notice the grammar here. The end, in what form is that? Is that singular or plural? That's singular, isn't it? There's one end, but there are many ways. There are many different ways that the devil lays out to get us to that single end. That end, though, of his death and destruction. It seems right. See, remember that song? How can it be wrong if it feels so right? And yet, the Bible tells us that we are in a war, a war between the spiritual nature and the carnal or fleshly nature, and that will exist until the Lord comes. But through Christ, we can subdue it and say no, repel the urges of the flesh. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain. That means to stay away from, doesn't it? To not engage in, to be separate from. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that do what? War against the soul. So for every one of us, there is a war that is going on. Just because we feel the tug of temptation doesn't mean that we are lost or unworthy or uh, are sinners because we can say no to that through Christ's power. I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a, a secret right there embedded in that passage, isn't it? If you walk in the Spirit, you will say no to the lusts of the flesh. So what do we need to do? We need to walk in the Spirit, don't we? The flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another. 
in every single one of our minds, that battle is going on. The, the choice must be made, that, though, which one will succeed, which one will be subdued. I love this passage in Micah. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. Now we'll cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. The word subdue is there, and it means to subject, to subdue, to force, to keep under, to bring into bondage, and to dominate. That goes right, right along with the Lord told Cain, you shall rule over it. Now we have the, that word used in other places like Genesis where Adam was to subdue the, the kingdom, animal kingdom, kingdom of nature. Numbers were talked about how the Israelites were to subdue the enemies that surrounded them. So the, the, the gospel promise is that the Lord can give us the ability to hold back, say no to the urges, and walk in the light. The other part of that passage, I learned something new. Uh, because of the blessing of being able to visit other churches around, we were at Forest Falls a couple weeks ago, and the children's story had a beautiful thought in it. And I want to share briefly with that. The one who was telling the story was quoting 1 Peter 5, 8, where it says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Remember that verse? So she focused on the word cast. And she said, you know, you can think of that word in two ways. You can cast like you do with a fishing pole or you cast a net. And you do that with the purpose of bringing back. You cast the rod, hopefully the fish bites on the, on the hook, and you bring it in. You bring it back to you. That's one way of casting. But she said there's another way that you can understand that. You can cast not just a debt or cast with a fishing line, but you can cast as a heavy stone so that it sinks and is gone forever. So when the Bible says he's going to cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea, which is it? Is it so that we can bring them back and brood over them and get discouraged? Or is it so that they're like a heavy stone thrown into the water and forever gone? He will cast all our sins. So the three parts again, if you do well, will you not be accepted? It is possible through Christ's strength to do well, to be righteous. And if so, we will have that euphoria, that sense of well-being that comes with obedience. But if you don't do that, sin is crouching at the door, ready to take over your life. Its desire is for you, but thou shalt rule over him. Again, we ask, were those empty words? When Jesus uh, was confronted with this situation, the ladies brought to him uh, caught in adultery in John chapter 8. And you remember the story how he uh, writes things on the dust of the temple floor. One by one, the accusers leave. Finally, he says, uh, where, where, where are your accusers? Has anybody accused you? And now, probably for the first time, she looks up and lo and behold, they're all gone. I believe what Jesus was writing in the dust were little clues as to those individuals and their pet sins. Because it says they left convicted. Anyway, they were all gone. And so when she said, no, no, no nobody's accusing me now. And what did he say? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Two, par two beautiful parts that make a whole. With, uh, without there being both of them together intact, it's an incomplete gospel. Neither do I condemn the yes, the Lord forgives our sins. He takes his eraser and makes our record clean. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Now, is Jesus in the, in the habit of telling people things that they can't do? I don't think so. What happens when you tell somebody something and it's impossible for them to do it? That results in frustration and disappointment, unhappiness. I don't believe that Jesus told that lady something that wasn't possible. When he said, go and sin no more, I believe that through Christ's strength, that is a possibility. Jude, now to him who is able to keep you from falling. Is that an impossibility? Is that a promise that can't be kept? No, we don't believe so. We go back to Hebrews. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying, God giving his own witness to that, to that by consuming his sacrifice. By faith, Enoch, when he was translated, he did not see death. He was not found because God had translated him before his translation. Pause on that for a minute. Actually, significant words. The word is before not the word after. 
Now, for some people, the gospel is that after translation, that's when we'll get right. That's, that's when we can be holy. Before translation, can we have the testimony that we live a life that's pleasing to God? The Bible says yes. Now, this is a most interesting text. This is from Balaam. Balaam had his moments. He was originally a prophet of the Lord, but he strayed away. But on occasion, when he was called to utter a curse against Israel, the Lord did not allow that to happen, and instead blessings came out from his mouth. And this is one thing that he, that he said. He said to Balak, concerning Israel, concerning the Lord, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. Now, among the things that Balaam said, we believe were... Uh, Phrases that were inspired by God. And we believe that the Lord inspired this statement. But that presents a very provocative thought, doesn't it? This is from the book of Numbers. What is the book of Numbers about? The wilderness wanderings. Is this at the first of the book of Numbers or is it the end of the book of Numbers? It's at the end of the book of Numbers. What has happened in the book of Numbers up to this point? Numbers chapter 12. You have an issue that involves uh, racial discrimination. They're complaining about Moses because he married a Cushite, a woman whose skin happened to be darker than his. And the Lord frowned upon that, as he always does. We have that in Numbers 12. We have in Numbers 16 and 17 the, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And then we have in Numbers 21... The story where the people murmured and complained so much that the Lord removed his hand of protection and the fiery serpents that were always there in the wilderness were allowed to afflict Israel. It wasn't that in Numbers 21 the Lord sent serp serpents from Moab or Ammon or Jordan or somewhere. They were always there. But the Lord said, no, can't touch them. That's my people. But when they murmured and complained to the point, the Lord withdrew his hand of protection. The people were bidden and many died. These things have all happened in the book of Numbers prior to Balaam's statement here. And yet Balaam said, which must mean that the people had repented, had forsaken their sins, and were right with God, were accepted with him, because he said, the Lord has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. Isn't that an amazing thing? Do you think that principle can apply to us? We've made mistakes here, 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 and here. But when we give our lives to the Lord and, and commit or recommit our lives to him, can he say to us, I have not observed iniquity in you. I have not seen wickedness in your life. That's true. Then we come to Revelation chapter 14. And it describes people, human beings. These are the ones who follow the lab wherever he goes. These were redeemed, purchased back from among men. They are the first fruits to God and to the, and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no guile, deceit, fraud, deception. They are without fault before the throne of God. That's the gospel that the Bible brings to light. And it was built right into the very name of that uh, our Savior bore. She shall bring forth a son, Mary was told, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jehovah is salvation, the background of that name. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's the gospel. And this promise is so beautiful in 1 Thessalonians 5. Faithful is he who calls thee, who also will do it. Do I do it? No, but I have to say yes. I have to consent. I have to invite the Lord into my life. So the good news was presented to Cain. We wish it could be the gospel according to Cain, being that he embraced it and lived it out. But the fact that he didn't accept it and experience it does not invalidate God's promise. What was spoken there were words of truth. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin is lying at the door. Unto thee shall be his desire, but thou shalt rule over it. The beautiful gospel message the Bible has to give to us is that Christ has made it possible for each one of us to be overcomers. In the words of the New Testament, um, super winners, more than conquerors. Here's the question for each of us today. Is it your desire, is it your choice to renounce sin and to ask God through his power 
to give you victory. If that's your choice, please raise your hand with me. Amen. May God bless us to that end, we pray. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to Him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 909-492-0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.